Bueno, siendo las 2 y 20 arrancamos ahí un poquitín atrasado, pero venimos bastante bien en tiempos. Eh, gracias a todos por estar del otro lado. Tercer charla del evento de fin de año. Eh, la verdad quiero presentar eh, a Alex Case. Eh, welcome Alex, how are you? I'm great, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be in Argentina. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Bueno, eh, es la primera vez que Alex Case da, da una charla para Latinoamérica, así que eh, la verdad es, es, es muy importante para nosotros. Eh, se nos ocurrió a mitad de año eh, con esto de la eh, esta nueva normalidad, digamos, y tantos webinars de bueno tener eh, algo de color para el evento de fin de año. Eh, y bueno, una distinción de tener a alguien internacional. Así que, bueno, gracias también a la, a la ayuda de César Larsen, que está ahí en, en el público. Eh, pudimos llegar a él y aceptó inmediatamente. Y, bueno, muy buen predispuesto, así que no le quiero sacar tiempo. Eh, Alex Case es... Eh, I will read a, a short bio, biography of uh, Alex Case. So, um, just uh, a second in Spanish, I, I will get back to you in English. Um, con un enfoque de investigación en estética, percepción, procesamiento de señales, historia, electroacústica y acústica de salas para la creación y grabaciones de sonido, Alex Case es autor de dos libros para Focal Press y cuatro cursos en linda.com relacionados con el procesamiento eficaz de señales en la grabación de sonido. Es miembro de Acoustical Society of America y de Audio Engineering Society, de AES, obviamente, del cual fue presidente, o sea, tenemos a un ex presidente de AES Internacional eh, dándonos una charla hoy para nosotros. Alex Case eh, se ha, pre ha presentado más de 100 artículos y tutoriales en su carrera. Es un gran educador. Eh, su blog, Re recordingology.com, eh, The Study of Recording, ofrece guías y referencias de audio que ilustran todos los aspectos de la grabación y la mezcla. Eh, y tiene otro proyecto que se llama chamberriverchallenge.com que es la respuesta según él, desde el audio que puede dar eh, al aislamiento social debido a la pandemia donde dice que todos están invitados a participar y a contribuir eh, es, esto es una breve eh, presentación, eh, la verdad que bueno, Alex es, eh, aprovecha esta charla porque la verdad es un educador muy muy bueno y tiene muy buenas charlas y bueno, hoy nos va a hablar de grabación de voces eh, antes de darle paso, me gustaría bueno, saber que si todos están usando el streamer.center o lo que están usando le está funcionando, cualquier cosa escriben por chat, no les hagamos tiempo, pero por favor no tengan miedo de escribir para que todos puedan entender la charla. Ciertas slides, eh, las presentaciones, perdón, tienen una traducción solo del título al español para que lo, lo puedan seguir, pero el resto de la presentación está en inglés como para que puedan también seguirlo. So, Alex, thank you for being here. I, I don't want to uh, steal you more time <laughs> from your slot. Um, thanks a lot in name of AES Argentina, AES Argentina, and it's all yours. Thanks very much. I, I fell asleep during that too. I'm sorry everyone had to endure all that discussion. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm, it's really impressive what AES Argentina is doing, uh, and it truly is an honor for me to, to be able to participate from here. Uh, and I apologize uh, that I can't do this in Spanish. I admire the energy and brains it takes to study a technical field in a different language. So thanks for hanging in there. I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed and really value that. Um, so, so what I plan to do, the way I think about almost everything in acoustics especially, is the source, the sound source, the sound path, and the sound receiver. So I'd like to study the human voice sort of looking at it as a musical instrument. How does the human voice work? And then let's look at the most important parts of the recording space around when we record a vocal. Uh, we Let's talk a little bit about microphones and then most especially let's talk about the signal processing when tracking and mixing to get the most out of a vocal. You might know a lot about how a piano works or a guitar works um, or saxophones. We know about resonant strings and columns of air. The human voice is its own interesting sound making instrument. Basically, we have the lungs as a source of airflow, and we get that by using our diaphragm and our intercostal muscles. And I should pause right here to say 
that most things in biology gross me out. I don't know if that's translatable, but I don't like squishy, drippy things. I much prefer looking at guitars than than the voice box. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into the biology and the physiology of it, but I think every great recording engineer should know at least a little bit the basics of how the sound is created. I think it'll give us intuition about everything that follows microphone selection and compression ideas. If we have at least a top level understanding of what's creating the vibration and what's shaping that vibration. So it all begins with our lungs providing a source of air to our larynx, which is the source, the first source of sound. The larynx contains what we casually call in English, the voice box. It has the vocal folds that, that we make to vibrate. It's just made of cartilage and muscle. And there, I just grossed myself out again. But it's basically the beginning of sound. And we use that voice box to create a, a pulse stream of harmonic energy. So we sort of define our pitch, but it has no meaning yet. So that, that resonance that happens in the larynx is then shaped. It's basically shaped by four resonant cavities that we can control the larynx itself and the pharynx just above it and then most especially the oral tract the way we shape our mouth and also the the nasal tract the way we shape things in the nasal cavity those just reshape the spectral content that comes out of the voice box that comes out of the larynx um, and then in addition to that we have these sort of articulators that finally reshape the resonances that we've created. So using our mouth, our tongue, our lips, our teeth, our palate and our tongue against that palate, we can basically make sound start and stop, which is what's happening when I start the word start and end the word stop. So we use our lips and our tongue to interrupt that flow of air and flow of vibration. And that that's basically the musical instrument that we use to create spoken word as well as uh, sung lyrics. Um, so we can look at that a little bit more closely. For vowels, it's basically mostly an open flow of air. We, we basically have the vocal tract open and we're shaping the resonances with, with what we do with our, with our pharynx, our larynx, our oral cavity and our nasal cavity. And, and vowels can be short or, or long. And in fact, they're, they're the greatest source of duration. It's really difficult to sustain a consonant. So we spend most of our time as singers on the vowels and the consonants just snap by very quickly. But the consonants are, of course, hugely important to our understanding of the lyrics and to our understanding of the emotion of the song. And the consonants are basically when we narrow or outright close the vocal tract to interrupt that flow of energy. And again, that's our tongue, our lips, our teeth, our palate, basically starting and stopping the flow of air and the, and the ability of that original resonance to escape our whole voice making apparatus out into the world and into the microphone. And a few consonants can be sung like M and N, um, but most consonants are very short in duration. So the, in the end, what we do is with our voice box, we create some pitched harmonic series that then gets reshaped through resonances depending on what we do with our mouth and our nose and our throat. And that gives us the net spectral overtone series that defines the voice. And then we give it meaning through what we do in the way that we start and stop this resonance system. So, so in a way, it's a knowable, understandable system. It's sort of miraculous that it works. Uh, on the off chance, you can actually still understand me. Um, that means this crazy system actually works. Um, and, and we don't need a biology degree or a physics degree to begin to understand how that works. Alex, uh, sorry I find... to yes. um, I don't think you are sharing the, the presentation. You do not see the screen? No, just just your camera. Sorry. Well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> do, 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 do. Share. That's really awful. I'm sorry. No problem. All right. Now we see UAD console <laughs> and now you see yeah oh, i'm so sorry this wasn't here no uh let me go back it's it's 
I know we're, time is going to be of the essence, but I want you to at least see this picture so that uh, we can a little bit better picture what I was talking about. So we have a source of airflow that initiates vibration in our larynx, that initiates vibration in our larynx, and then we reshape it by the next part in our throat, the pharynx, and then most especially by what we do with our mouth and the oral cavity and with the soft tissue that we can move in our nasal cavity and the coupling of our nasal cavity to the oral cavity. Thanks for interrupting me. This is my first Zoom session ever. Not really, this is where we all live now. So I, I wanna talk to you about the, the, the yin and yang of audio. Um, there's a, a really elegant parallel that informs a lot of what we do in audio. If we can, if we can make our way from the time domain to the frequency domain, when we look at the squiggly waveform in our digital audio workstation, we're looking at a time domain presentation of the audio. So we have amplitude versus time. The horizontal axis is time, but most of the critical listening we do is really intellectually in the frequency domain where we listen to a signal and we decide, does it have enough 1K? Does it have too much 10K? So that's us taking a time domain signal and remapping it to the frequency domain and looking at amplitude as a function of frequency. And really a great engineer has to be able to hop back and forth between a time domain way of looking at audio and a frequency domain looking frequency domain way of looking at audio. But there's an, a, a couple of extremes that we should understand that I, I think informs the vocal and really all musical instruments. If we think of a sine wave, it's, it's hard to sing along to or dance to and have much fun, but a sine wave is interesting in that a sine wave lasts forever and it has energy at one frequency only. And a sine wave truly does last forever. I don't have time to draw, draw the whole sine wave. I've just shown one cycle here, but you all know what a sine wave looks like. A sine wave goes on forever. And in fact, a true sine wave has always gone on. If you start or stop a sine wave, it's non-sinusoidal. You get a burst of energy there, right? So the sine wave has to be ongoing, continuous in time, never stopping in time for it to have this property that it is absolutely discrete in frequency. So we have something that's infinite in the time domain being very narrow, completely discrete in the frequency domain. And it works the other way around. If we have a signal that's infinitely short in the time domain, that's an impulse, a direct delta function. It's an energy that snaps on and immediately snaps off. It has almost no duration. Its duration could be one sample long. Something that's that discrete in time turns out to be a broadband event. If it's a true impulse, it actually has energy at all frequencies, below what we can hear and above what we can hear. So what's in fact discrete in the time domain is infinite in the frequency domain. And everything else is somewhere in between this, from, from discrete in the time domain to snare drum that lasts a little bit longer, to a tom that lasts longer still, to a quarter note, to a whole note, to a sung phrase. We basically expand things in time and things grow more complex in the frequency domain. But I like this idea that in the upper left, what's infinite in time is in the upper right, discrete in frequency. But what in the lower left is discrete in time is infinite in frequency. I think that helps us to understand what to listen for in all signals. But for the human voice, I would point out that vowels are largely analogous to the long time domain sort of um, behavior. So they're going to have frequency spikes. They're going to have pockets of, of frequency focus. Whereas the consonants are almost always, with the exception of M and N and R, there are a few consonants you can, you can continue to pass air while you say them, but most of them are very short in time. So we should think of those as brief instances of broadband energy. So we have the tonal overtone series when someone sings a note, a vowel, and then we have these bursts of broadband energy as someone adds meaning to what they're singing by singing words with consonants, of course, between those vowels. A little bit more then, so vowels are the sustained part and they're just shape resonances. And for the most part, they're the lower to low mid frequency content in a signal. Whereas the consonants, which are basically shaped impulses, they're not, they're never a perfect impulse. That sort of the theory of infinitely short in time is just a way to begin to think about it. We have shaped impulses, which means that, that when we create the sound of a B or a P, 
um, we're creating an impulsive broadband sort of sound with its own spectral contour. But the, the main focus of that energy is going to be in the mids to upper mids. So it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but I think it's fair to say that you could you could break the vocal down into lows and low mids are the vowels and mids and upper mids are where the consonants live and if you're having trouble with intelligibility we look for the mids and upper mids and see if there's competition there from the guitars a common culprit and do we need to do something with eq or compression to make it easier to hear the upper mid fre frequency energy of the vocal so as to better understand the words of the song a little bit more on the human voice as a musical instrument we are pretty directional most of the sound energy is in front of us not much goes above and, and very little goes behind and if we look from above you can see that we are all shep's expensive shep's subcardioid pickup patterns we're we're neumann km 50s we're we're almost cardioid uh, and and it it doesn't change much with level if you raise your intensity most of your energy is still very much in front of you. You start to tend towards a little bit closer to omnidirectional when you're yelling, um, but we shouldn't yell, we should just sing. A little bit on how the voice gets louder when singing, it turns out that as we sing at higher and higher intensity, we shift the spectrum towards the higher frequency energy as well. It turns out it's very hard to 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 sing loudly without energizing more overtones in the signal and most instruments are that way percussive instruments guitars strings saxophones the harder you play the more upper mid frequency energy you stimulate and the same thing happens with the human voice i should note also that if if you're trying to you can do some experiments on your own you know a, an advantage to being socially isolated you could never do this in a room full of people but all alone you could do this you could on your own start yelling and no one will notice that it's a problem. If, if you try to sing very loudly or speak very loudly, you'll find, and I'm hoping some of you are experimenting right now, uh, you'll find you, you can't really modulate the level of the consonants. You can make the vowels louder, but a P is a P. You can make it a little bit louder, but not a lot louder. So it's a curiosity of the physical acoustics of, of this musical instrument, the human voice, that it's primarily the vowels that get louder. And that might tell you something about what you need to look for when you're recording and mixing a vocal, if you're having trouble understanding the words um, at higher dynamic levels. Um, with with increasing level comes increasing directionality, um, and and it's true that's the usual formula as a function of frequency. The low frequencies are red, so it goes from red to blue as we go from low to high. So we are like many instruments, more omni at lows than than at mids and highs, and we're quite directional. We're basically modified cardioids uh, when we're radiating sound horizontally. Uh, and then the vertical the vertical plane is consistent with what we just saw in the in the earlier slide. So that's enough on the human voice. Let's take a look at the recording space that we're likely to use. I think that we, I hope that we will soon be back in large studios again. And it may be that the vocal is a is a it's difficult to choose where to record when you're in a recording studio. When we're in a home studio, we often have no choice as to where to record. But in the recording studio where you have a huge live room potentially, maybe it's a dividable live room with large gobos or movable dividers. Maybe they have an ISO booth or you can of course always sing in the control room. So it's a good question where should you track the vocal? I mean, an ISO booth is sometimes called a vocal booth. So does that mean we always record in a vocal booth? The answer is absolutely not. So in a tracking session where you need isolation, of course, you'll put the singer in a booth. Um, you know, the singer never wants to get too close to the drummer in general. So it's good to separate them. Um, but for an overdub, if it's just the singer, if it's one voice, one microphone, no one else is there, don't be fooled into thinking vocals are supposed to be in the vocal booth. Do the vocals out in the live room. And basically what we do is we create a space in, in the room that's very comfortable and that sounds uh, appropriate for, for a vocal overdub. But the first step of that is to get them out of the booth and let them be in what is likely the most comfortable room, the big room, the live room, the room that's on all the brochures for the studio for the reason they booked it there and so on. 
But before we get into the acoustics that you see there, you see a microphone, a pop filter, and some gobos, um, we should make sure we note that the singer's comfort is really important. Um, this is true for all performers. They need to be comfortable so that they're happy so that they can perform. But uh, the, the vocal instrument is really sensitive to temperature and to humidity. There are, there are some very famous singers who will in their rider say no air conditioning the day before they sing. They don't want their larynx to get dry. It will change their tone and maybe uh, in a way that they don't like or that could even damage their voice. So the, be, be prepared for singers to have strong opinions about temperature and the reason for no air conditioning, it's really about humidity. But we also want to make them comfortable, not just in the quality of the air, but lighting, having beverage, having a place to sit, having a table, giving them necessary privacy and creating a vibe and ambience. The things you do for all performers, it's probably most important for a singer. I think that there's no, there's probably no more expressive musical instrument, is there, than the human voice. It is so full of emotion. We want a great saxophone player or guitarist or drummer to be able to express emotion. But the instrument with which we connect the most for happiness, sadness, for storytelling, and the whole range of associated emotions comes from speaking to people. And, the, and when the singer speaks to us, when the singer sings a message to us, it's rich with emotion. They have to be actors. They have to be able to assume all these emotions and to create within the tone of their instrument the happiness or the sad sadness. And we need that to read somehow in a sound recording months later where you can't see the singer. So they need to be able to emote and uh, across a range of, of feelings. And they can't do that if they feel like they're being watched too much, if they feel like they can't trust you, if they feel like uh, it's a little too warm, it's a little too bright. So even we want all singers to be happy and comfortable performing, but we go through crazy rituals and I think it's a good idea to do so for singers. You'll find some singers or, or even if the singers don't ask for it, maybe you'll see great producers they, they have their own portfolio of string lights and lava lamps and candles and, and coffee mugs. And, and it's all about keeping certain singers very happy. So that's probably the most important aspect of getting a good vocal is singer comfort. Then there are some production challenges. Please note, we haven't talked about microphones or compressors yet. All this other stuff is far more important. Um, once the singer is comfortable and we're, and we're tending to that, then we need to think about the production challenge. And so the production challenge is really about ease of communication. The singer needs to feel heard and supported, but the singer is looking to a producer for guidance on, was that a good take? How should I do it differently? What's right and what's wrong? And, and if we have the singer not in the control room, if they're anywhere else, then we have this impediment to communication. So we need to make sure that this communication through glass by way of microphones and headphones, we need to make sure this is, is as free flowing as possible. So there's a real skill, a real dexterity, a real uh, proficiency that all producers and engineers need to have. And frankly, that all studio musicians need to have in return, which is this ability to communicate effectively and honestly, and without any, with well, with minimal chance for misunderstanding, even though it gets mediated by a microphone and a camera or a microphone and, and the glass of the control room window. And so this is both visual and aural. We want good line of sight so that we can all see each other and see emotion. Um, and then we need to think hard about having a talk back microphone and a listen back microphone. So what we call, what we engineers call the talkback microphone is our microphone at the console where we talk to them. But we need to make sure we have the ability to listen back from them. They don't get to push a button. They're just at a microphone. We need to make sure we're not always stepping on what they say. Um, so be aware that it's not trivial if you feel like they're not hearing you. Um, you want to make sure you can speak in a regular level in the control room and have it appear in their headphones at a regular, comfortable level so that it never sounds like screaming. It never adds stress. If you have to yell over the band to be heard, that's just an agitating environment to, to have created. The other thing this points to is that the monitor mix that they hear while singing is really important. Not only do they need to hear you and you hear them while communicating, they need to hear an inspiring 
rough mix of what they're singing to. So increasingly, we take this idea of a monitor mix and take it very far. Many producers will, will feed to the headphones something that sounds like a mastered two mix so that what they hear in the headphones makes them feel like, yes, they're on track to a great sounding record. And yes, they're up for this. They're good enough to be doing this. They don't want to feel like everything is disappointing in their headphones compared increasingly to what they hear from a final mix. So the getting a great sounding headphone mix is itself its own art. And at last, I'll speak to sound quality. Of course, we are going to reach for the best sound quality we can. So we want very good sounding headphones. We don't mess around with microphone selection. More on that soon. Um, so sound quality does matter. We'll come back to that. But another aspect is speed and productivity. We the things in the studio can slow down way too much as we get too careful and that interferes with the creative process. So we're, we have to work fast so that someone can have a good idea and go implement it so that someone can make a mistake, get feedback and remember what to do differently next time. So not only should we pay, be fast in the studio so that we make good use of their financial resources, but a fast studio is also also an agile studio and it it basically lets everyone be comfortable and creative and waste no energy waiting and spend all their energy moving forward into into the pursuit of better ideas and better performances okay so what about the location where we should record them um, it's nice to be in the same room with someone to facilitate all that production stuff we just described, right? So if we're in the same room as the singer, we can have a regular conversation without talkback buttons, without microphones, without headphones, just set up a good mix uh, in the control room and let them sing. And that's okay. It's done all the time. There was a Grammy winning record last year from Billie Eilish, a US artist. I don't know that she would be that well known in Argentina, but it got a lot of attention, not only because the music was quite interesting, interesting, but this is the studio where they recorded it. It's basically her, her co-producer is her brother and they created most of the record in his bedroom. This is two views of his bedroom. That's his bed where his sister sat and sang the, the award-winning vocals. And if you turn around, this is the, what she was facing his pro tool rigs and a piano and keyboards that you can, you can get great sounds. You can create art in any space. Um, so it's okay to be in the control room uh, or in a home studio, in the living room or bedroom of a home studio, we can get it done, but it's full of some compromises. So uh, it's really best to be in a vocal zone in the studio. I highly recommend that we even, you know, even if we're socially isolated now and we're with a singer is in a bedroom or a living room out of necessity because we can't all be in with a band in a commercial studio right now, I still recommend that we have the skill to work at a high level in a world-class studio. And the way vocals are almost always done is that you create a vocal zone in the studio. And this vocal zone is kind of a, it's a gobo defined wedge of space within the live room. And the acoustic goals are we want a close mic on a singer. So we want the vivid, exaggerated timbral detail that comes from being close to a microphone. But we don't really want to record the sound of the room and especially the sound of a booth. The sonic signature of a of an energized booth always sounds like a small room. And it's 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 it puts you at a disadvantage when you're trying to mix it if it already has that sound. So we, while we're putting the singer in a live room, we actually don't want the sound of the live room either. We really just want the sound of the microphone. We just want the singer to be in a comfortable space. We know she would like to energize the entire space and it's more fun to sing in a bigger room than in a smaller room. So we we're putting them in a live room so that they can sing to the live room, but then we do everything we can to capture really only the directed sound with minimal reflections and minimal reverberation. So we, we would set up this gobo defined area in a quiet part of the room. If you know there's air conditioning rumble in one corner, we should go to the other. Um, and what we do to capture as little of the room and reflections as possible is we use a directional microphone most of the time. We'll talk about microphones in a little bit more detail shortly. But one reason for using a cardioid microphone 
is that we don't want much the energy of the room. We'll, we'll deal with ambience and reflections and reverberance decisions later as a mixed decision, not a tracking decision. Most of the time there are exceptions. And to be clear, by the way, I'm not speaking about operatic performances at all. Um, this is just for the typical exaggerated, larger than life, better than the real thing, pop vocal. Um, and these gobos are there so that the direction that the microphone is looking, it doesn't see the live room either. The microphone sees gobos. And it, if the gobos have an absorptive side and a reflective or diffusive side, we're putting the, the absorptive side on the singer side. And the idea is that any, any energy that comes back from the room towards the singer, when it hits the gobos, it's largely absorbed or scattered away from the microphone. We want the reflected energy to be much lower than the directed energy. Um, that's the, than the direct energy that's re reaching the microphone. And by the way, another acoustic essential to keep track of is that the music stand can vibrate and resonate and often could be accidentally angled to be a reflector looking right at the microphone. So we actually strategically arrange the music stand so that they can read their lyrics, uh, that it has good light and they have good line of sight around the microphone to the music stand, but we don't want it to be an acoustic reflector. So we'll angle it so that most of the energy reflects harmlessly away from the microphone into the room. And it's common to put some dampening material, a towel or, or even a piece of carpet as shown in this picture, so that it's not a, a bright reflection coming off of that music stand. So you could be in the same room, work in the control room and work in the bedroom, but you really you can you can really only get away with that if it's a low performance dynamic. If the singer is really belting out, if they really energize the space, it, it's not going to work. So the Billie Eilish recording works because of the style of music and the style of her singing. If she sang like Mick Jagger, it, it's not going to work. So if we can learn to use this gobo defined vocal zone in the studio, that means we can record any performance dynamic from low level and intimate to really aggressive and high level. So we should learn the skill as singers, if that's, if that's our desire, and especially as producers, get good at working with this really contrived situation of a vocal defined space, a gobo defined space uh, within the live room. Let's move on a little bit then to how we think about microphones. If we look at the first microphones that were really thought of as interesting vocal microphones, it actually starts with the ribbon microphone, not the dynamic. The ribbon comes first in terms of being a studio quality microphone. And we all know about ribbon microphones and how they typically have a bi-directional pickup pattern. They typically have um, a, this low frequency lift associated with proximity effect and all ribbons are differently are different, but they typical typically roll off at the high end in a sort of graceful way. And that leads to a, a certain kind of sound, which if it's embraced, you can get the sort of crooner sound of Nat Cole and Bing Crosby, where they deliberately got in close to the ribbon microphone to give themselves a deeper fullness of tone. And they use the high end roll off that's, that's sort of gentle, but starts, you can see the frequency response for this old RCA 44. It's starting in the upper mids and falling, rolling off, but it doesn't roll off quickly. And the result is a kind of silkiness of tone. Uh, it raises words like that. And, and I'll just mention that uh, I created some tiny URLs that you can go to for almost every sound example I'm going to play today. And for many that I won't play today because there's not time. But if you go to tinyurl.com slash vocal microphones, and there'll be a list of this on, on of the other links on the last slide. So you can take screenshots, then um, it, it's going to step through a lot of different recordings. Uh, and it gives you audio examples of different recordings on different microphones, including some of these tunes of Nat Cole, and others singing at this time on ribbon microphones. So the ribbon comes first, and it defines a style of recording. Um, the, the crooner sort of sound, um, but it can also be used in a less aggressive way. If the singer has some distance from the ribbon microphone, then it doesn't have the silly exaggerated proximity effect. Then it just becomes a really excellent sounding, appropriate choice for a vocal microphone. And, and it'll be a vocal microphone that has some roll off in the highs, but in a, in a world of digital audio, which I think is here to stay, it might be fair to say that sometimes vocals are a little bit too shrill, a little bit too harsh, and maybe the, the craft that evolved for getting a very hyped vocal sound was in part trying to overcome 
weaknesses in tape or weaknesses in vinyl where over time maybe the high end was slightly dulled but if digital is going to preserve that maybe it's time to rethink and revisit and go back to ribbon microphones more than we have in the last 10 or 20 years because we now know that we have a digital delivery path all the way to the end user and maybe this sort of sound with or without the proximity effect is something to go for so I highly recommend you still consider ribbon microphones as a choice uh, for your singer. But for sure, the dominant technology for capturing a, a lead vocal is the large diaphragm tube cardioid condenser. And it sort of was defined by the U47 and all her descendants and competitors. But the idea is that the condenser reaches much higher in frequency than a ribbon microphone can. So it's got much more expressive detail, much more transient detail. And it often, and especially in a cardioid pattern, which is the upper frequency plot here, cardioid and omni is what's shown here for this original spec for U47. Um, that upper presence peak, we know a lot about it. We're basically looking to exaggerate the intelligibility of the vocal by having not a flat microphone, but having the extended lift in the upper mid. and 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 this is this is the typical formula for selecting a vocal microphone is we choose a large diaphragm cardioid condenser whose presence peak is most flattering to the vocal and so if you happen to have a u47 and a 251 and a c414 and a ksm1 the KSM 44, et cetera, Audio Technica 4050. I don't want to piss off any of the many great microphone manufacturers that there are. We have many choices for large diaphragm cardioid condensers, tube or not. And a lot of what we do when we choose them is we figure out which one has a presence peak character that is flattering to the sound of our vocalist. There's not a best vocal microphone. This frequency lift might sound good on one singer, but unnatural or exaggerated or unpleasant on another singer. So the cardioid condenser basically opens up the world to having a very hi-fi sounding, very beautiful sounding, very expressive sounding vocal. And we get we have in the history of music, we have the chance to compare ribbon versus condenser because while Frank Sinatra never was the crooner sort of style, he sang into a ribbon mic during his RCA years. And when he was signed to Capitol and moved to Capitol Studios, they were often using, of course, the U47 that we see in all the photos. So if you compare the older recordings to the sort of mid-career recordings, you're basically going to hear the same voice and a very different transducer. And it's it's a good education. And again, I have some compare and contrast there uh, at Vocal Microphones. It's basically uh, all with in some pages of the blog recordingology.com. So there's lots to listen to and learn from there. And it really reveals there's not a right answer. It's a it's an aesthetic choice that it's a choice that you will make. Which microphone do you think is better for this song for this artist? But the large diaphragm cardioid condenser really does dominate to this day. I encourage you to think about ribbons too. Now, what about dynamic microphones? The first directional moving coil microphone was invented by Shore in 1939, and it's still made to this day. Um, so this was an early choice for the microphone, uh, an alternative technology. And uh, for sure, it was used live. It's fairly indestructible, and the cardioid pattern makes it pick up uh, our feedback resistant. So for sure, as a live microphone, uh, it really owns the world at this time in the early you know 40s 50s and and even to this day um and my favorite zoom microphone i'm not using it today but my favorite zoom microphone is a, def a descendant of this that's what i teach on um today i'm speaking to you i didn't mess around it's a U u87 today because i want it to sound good at aes argentina but this is a great microphone to use and are dynamics used in the studio of course they are there are many artists who use moving coil dynamic microphones for some recordings, the, some major released recordings that you know and may even enjoy. No super expensive large diaphragm tube condenser necessarily. For example, Peter Gabriel, it's not until so, so all his records before so are believed to be all moving coil dynamic. In fact, specifically a Shure SM57, which is kind of crazy. 
but Blood Sugar Sex Magic was recorded. The vocals were famously recorded with just an SM7B. And we know that the late Bruce Swedean, who just left us, recorded. He made a bold choice when he was beginning to record uh, an album you may have heard of called Thriller. And he chose for the lead vocals. This isn't true for a lot of backing vocals, but for the lead vocals, that's Michael on a Shure SM7. So a moving coil dynamic. And there are reasons for a moving coil dynamic that are technical, not just aesthetic. I mean, the, the human voice, has a, a surprisingly intense level. Uh, the human voice has an RMS level when someone is singing that can be 120 to 130 dB SPL. And that's not when you're in the room with someone, that's when you're at a close microphone placement. So if anyone spoke to you at full voice with your ear inches away from them, you would then realize very quickly as you damage your hearing that yes, the human voice for a close mic placement is very high sound pressure level. And I'm saying RMS level, average level, 120 to 130, peaks are much above that, maybe 20 dB peaks to average. So that means you can have instances at a close mic of 150 dB SPL for someone who's really belting, for someone who's really singing, for someone who's singing with an aggressive style. And so that is a great reason to reach for a moving coil microphone because it can handle those transients uh, much better than a condenser or a ribbon would. Those other microphones are sure to clip. And the, the condenser could clip at the microphone within the electronics of the microphone or at the microphone preamp. But the moving, moving coil transducer is going to round off those peaks. It can handle it without distortion. It can handle the very strong articulation. Uh, so that is a great reason. And there are many styles of music where, where the singer is expected to be aggressive, the singer is expected to be as much percussive as, as vocal. And we reach for moving coil dynamic microphones for, for those singers and often in those genres. And if you're having a problem with distortion and you don't want to change microphones, if you feel like you want the the extended high frequency accuracy of a condenser, but you keep getting distortion, then you may have to abandon close microphone placement and just let the microphone be if it's two or three feet away, which is an unusual placement for pop music. But if it's two or three feet away, there's no longer any fear of these transients overloading the microphone. So for microphone selection to try to sum up, most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time in pop music, we're going for a close placement. We want that because we, the music fans want to feel like they know the singer. They want to be best friends with the singer. They want to welcome the singer into their car, into their home. And the way we create that sort of relationship orally, sonically, is that we give them all the emotional detail we can, all the timbral detail we can, and a microphone really close about six inches away from the really close to the singer is a way to capture all that amazing detail that is lost if you just back up the microphone a few feet. We also often try to focus on the direct sound. So we want a directional microphone and this introduces the chance for proximity effect, right? An omnidirectional microphone has no proximity effect. A bi-directional has the most. A cardioid microphone has half the proximity effect. This is a property of, of the physics of pressure and pressure difference transducers. So if we need a directional microphone, we need to recognize there will be proximity effect and that can be good. That can be wanted coloration. We know for spoken word, a lot of DJs like the low frequency emphasis, but you have to decide if it's flattering to the singer or not. And you, it may be that you want close microphone placement, but you'll attenuate the lows a little bit so that it's not too boomy, not too muddy in the mix. So, we choose additional coloration, not only just through the microphone selection, but also in how we pair it with the preamplifier. And of course, the, the impedance uh, relationship between the microphone and the microphone preamplifier essentially becomes an equalizer. But we also look for or avoid other forms of, of coloration. And that is, could the preamp be a tube or solid state? Is there a transformer in the audio path or not? Those are basically technologies which serve their job, but also introduce spectral coloration and distortion. Uh, and we would choose to have that or not. And it's, it's often the case in the lead vocal that we're not going for accuracy. We don't use omnis through hardy preamps that often. We often use microphones with non-flat frequency response, exaggerated lows, exaggerated mids, and why not reach for a tube mic pre or allow a transformer uh, in that audio path
path, courtesy of an API or Neve sort of piece of gear to add additional coloration, not seeking accuracy, but seeking um, coloration and exaggeration and character. The large diaphragm condenser for sure is the first choice. It's got that flattering upper mid frequency lift and it's got the high frequency detail that a condenser has that no ribbon and very few moving coil microphones can really do. And, and this upper frequency accuracy lets us capture breath and fragility and emotion and intensity. And, and just to do an exercise in how important that, that spectral detail is, do you imagine that you can tell without seeing someone, do you think while someone is speaking or singing, can you hear if they're smiling or scowling or frowning? I think most of the time we can. Uh, what is the difference between someone singing with a poker face and someone singing while smiling? It's just a slight reshaping of the oral tract that we hear and have learned that that spectral quality is associated with someone smiling, which could be a good thing. Um, so, so we need a microphone. If we want emotion to read by the time the thing is mixed and mastered, if we want to hear the emotion in that vocal, we probably need to capture with great detail, all those little spectral characteristics that identify elements of emotion. So the large diaphragm condenser remains a great choice for that reason, but I would encourage you to think about the ribbon. Um, it's got this gentle roll off at high frequencies that can sound very flattering. Some vocalists are very edgy sounding. We reach for ribbons for brass and muted brass to tame the high end. Some singers have a high end that needs taming. So don't abandon the ribbon. Don't fall always for the condenser microphone. Sometimes the ribbon is, is a beautiful choice for some singers and it can have prox, a pronounced proximity effect, which can be your friend, or you can simply try to roll it off. And don't forget the moving coil. It also has its own flattering upper mid frequency lift. So it's got the presence peak that we expect from a condenser, but it doesn't have the high frequency reach of the condenser. Uh, and maybe that's good to get rid of that. And it can handle very high SPL without clipping. So in the end, there's no right answer for vocal microphones. I give you permission to continuously shop for new and more microphones. And I can give you a note from the doctor if you need to persuade someone that you're allowed to go get an, yet another vocal microphone. Let's look then finally at signal processing associated with both tracking and mixing the vocal. I have to emphasize, I'm honor bound to emphasize that first is the vocals, the singer's performance, which means comfort and skill and, uh, and, and your management, your production of that whole session. But if we're going to talk gear, then first is the microphone selection itself. All these effects are, are subservient to what you've chosen with the microphone. Uh, but yes, EQ delay, reverb, spreading and thickening, compression, distortion, pitch shift. That's what I want to talk about next. And while we're talking about vocals today, some of you who might have put up with me at other AES meetings have maybe heard me give a talk on piano or on guitar or on recording drums. So I make my way through the instruments in exactly this tedious way where we look at the instrument and we try to break it down in this way. But the thing I'm, I study most probably is signal processing effects. And this is an incomplete list of how I think about, this is a good summary of how I think about signal processing effects, not just for vocals, but for life. And this is presented in, in the book, uh, Mix Smart. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about this anytime when, if you can grab me in the hallway at a future AAS meeting, that would be fun to do. But so the, the approach that I take for thinking about signal processing is I try not to have an effect device based view of things. I try to have a production motivation for why I use any effect. And so the three rows of fix fit and feature are pretty critical to how you can prioritize and organize thinking about effects. And many of these apply to vocals. So the idea of fix is the, it, you may not realize this, but recording engineers spend a lot of time just fixing known problems or better yet, preventing known likely problems from ever happening. That's a really important job of the recording engineer. And so that's about gain staging and choosing the right mic for the right job is we just don't let distortion or noise happen uh, or other things that could go wrong. A lot of signal processing motivations are about simply fixing and preventing mistakes from happening. 
The middle step I call fit. It's the it's fitting the jigsaw puzzle of a multi-track arrangement together, fitting all the pieces together so that the musical ideas get through, so that we understand uh, what every performer is doing individually, and we get to hear the counterpoint interweaving of all those parts to hear the whole song and its fullest arrangement. So fit is, is the signal processing gestures we make to make it so that the piano doesn't compete too much with the guitar and that they don't drown out the vocal and that the snare isn't disappointing when the guitar is playing and so on. So fit is a lot about uh, uh, piecing together things that's really impossible. We have two ears, we have two signals coming at us in stereo. We can only reach from 20 to 20,000 Hertz. That's really limited real estate to fit together 200 tracks in a multi-track production. Um, so we do a lot of things to, to chase down ways of making different tracks fit together better. And then the third step is feature where that's the fun part finally, where we feature some aspect of the track in a, in a more exaggerated sort of way. That's, that's where we do the more elaborate, crazy signal processing. Um, and, and I would just discourage you from starting at feature and, in, and first tend to things that need fixing, have an ear on how things are going to fit together, even as you add the wacky effects associated with featuring things. So let's step through that as it applies to the vocal. So for fixing things, we're gonna talk about the EQ we do associated with pops, wind and proximity effect. And then we'll speak very briefly to some something I call safety compression, uh, peak reduction and de-essing. And I think you know about all of this, but let's just make sure we fully appreciate it. I'm a professor of audio and being a professor of audio means I know my favorite microphone for every pop quiz. It's the microphone with the most switches. So the 414 in its current form has a number of switches and it, we, we should really em embrace what the designers of this microphone intended for some of these switches. And I just draw your attention to the roll-off switch. There's a four position roll-off switch on this C414 where it can be flat or it can be set to 40 or 80 Hertz. What's not shown on the microphone, but is, it's shown in the manual and shown in the frequency response plots is that if you select a roll-off at 40 or 80 Hertz, it's a steep slope. It's 12 dB per octave. That's really intended to be an EQ that helps you with pop filtering. A pop, hopefully you have a pop filter to stop a breeze from a P or a B from reaching the capsule. But if any air, basically DC blowing air hits the capsule, from a B or a P or any sort of plosive consonant where we've used our speech making, our singing apparatus to briefly stop and then restart this, this airflow with vibration, um, we, we need to get rid of those low frequency artifacts that will occur. So the, the, we do it acoustically with an acoustic high pass filter, which is the windscreen and the pop filter. Additional defenses would be these roll-offs. These are meant to be very low and very steep so that they, not just for vocals, but for any instrument, they help you tame the energy at the low frequencies associated with the pop or any wind noise. If you happen to be gathering sounds outside, it helps you get rid of the low frequency artifact associated with that, but it's a steep filter so that the filter gets out of the way and lets you hear the rest of the signal with minimal spectral alteration. But if you choose the highest choice of filter, the 180 hertz choice on the 414, the present model they're making today, that has a more gradual slope. That's just 6 dB per octave. And this is meant to be a taming of proximity effect. They know where their proximity effect starts as you get very close to this microphone. And they know that a 6 dB per octave filter starting higher at about 180 hertz is a good way to tame the proximity effect if you don't want it. Of course, it doesn't perfectly undo proximity effect, but that's why it's there. It's not just a higher frequency uh, um, high pass filter. It is specifically a shallower slope, higher frequency high pass filter to help undo proximity effect. So this is us as recording engineers using the microphone to fix very frequent problems in vocals, which is, oops, a plosive reached the capsule and we have a low frequency thump that's annoying and we have to get rid of it. There are many other elaborate solutions to this. You may be aware, I hope you're all aware that if you're using a 441 or a 421 on the collar of that microphone is a multi-position switch that basically goes from M to S, which mean music means music to speech, but it's really a multi-position 
roll-off switch that is really useful for taming proximity effect and taming plosives. So you'll see that it's got a complex slope. At the very low frequencies, it's steeper. That's for controlling plosives, pops and wind. And then it has a more gradual area up higher, and that's for undoing proximity effect. These are both directional microphones. The 441 is hypercardioid. The 421 is cardioid. They know that maybe you want some, but not all of the proximity effect. So I encourage you to explore the many different positions of the switch. Those are thoughtfully designed microphones. And for spoken word, those roll-off filters are really valuable for, for changing the EQ as a function of proximity effect, as a function of their distance. And you can turn a boomy microphone into a less boomy microphone, but still preserve enough riches, richness of tone uh, by choosing an intermediate uh, position of that switch. Please mute the microphone before you rotate that switch. It's going to give you a little bit of a click or a clunk. You'll be buying new monitors when you should have been buying new microphones. I'll just remind you that the signal, the dynamic range of the human voice for close mic placement is intense. Snare drum is loud, of course, no matter where you are, snare drum is loud, but it turns out the human voice is surprisingly high in amplitude when you're really close to it. As we said, the individual peaks can be as much as 150 dB SPL. So sometimes we have to attack the vocal with peak limiting. Um, basically not really peak limiting the way you would on a broadcast chain, but maybe a slightly gentler peak reduction. So it's fast attack and fast release, but maybe back off the ratio. So it's sort of in the range of 10 to one or four to one. Um, and you would do this during mix down, not tracking, but you may find that those peaks are just too intense uh, and become too distracting in the mix, too difficult to fit the vocal in around the rest of the mix. And if you get the vocal at a good level in the mix, you may find that these peaks are, ca are causing clipping on the mix bus, or they push the any mix bus compression into action when you really don't want the vocal to trigger it. So another to prevent a common problem associated with the spectral, sorry, with the with the intense dynamic peaks of, of a human voice when close mic, we sometimes insert some amount of peak limiting uh, in the chain at mix down. I realize I'm speaking too quickly. I told myself to speak slowly, to give everyone a chance, and I'm too excited about the vocal. So I want to tell you as much as I can. I, I appreciate you hanging in there, the stamina it takes to to listen to me rattle on in English. Um, Great. Thanks, Alex. I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I want to speak about DSing because I, I remember when I first learned of DSing, I was sort of annoyed. Why on S? Why on earth would we DS? Uh, why would there be too many S's? I, I don't find when I am speaking to mom on the phone I, that I need to DS. Um, probably you're not finding we need to DS while I'm speaking to you now, though I am very close to a microphone right now. But why on earth would we need to DS? Well, it has to do with the entire production chain, including being very close mic'd. Of course, it begins with the diction of the singer. Singers, keep in mind, are uh, classically trained, especially they study diction and, and they learn how to pronounce so that all their consonants are absolutely clear so that a B is not mistaken for a P an S is not misheard as a Z because that would change the meaning of the lyric. So singers often have exaggerated diction as part of their craft. Um, and then when we put a microphone really close to that, we're in search of exaggerated timbral detail, but there we are with a microphone that has minimal air absorption, you know, as sound travels through the air, energy is absorbed and it would tame the high frequencies. But when you're really close, what we want on purpose, the reason we are close is we get all this high frequency detail associated with emotion and the unique quality of Aretha Franklin or Tom Petty or whoever that artist is. But doing so means the S's are going to be much louder than they naturally are at a more normal listening distance. And then in our choice of microphones, we've we've talked about reaching for a presence peak on purpose. That's going to be a mid frequency lift somewhere that's going to make the vocal sound more beautiful, but it's also going to raise the amplitude of the S's. And then the effects we are often using would include EQ, where we might do spectral lifts to improve intelligibility. We're dealing with masking and fitting together the jigsaw puzzle. Uh, so we're, we're doing all kinds of aggressive EQ moves, potentially trying to capture detail and expression. And, and basically what happens is 
when the overall tone of the voice sounds great after we've done all the things we chose to do with microphone selection and placement and EQ, when it's sounding great as they sing the song, it turns out that spectral quality will exaggerate the S's. What sounds good when they do everything but the S is too loud in the S's. And then compression is often at such a slow attack window to not attenuate the S's themselves. So compression isn't going to help prevent, protect us from that. So that's, that's, and oh, by the way, if we're using, uh, as we are using, I should say, digital recorders, anything that we might have gotten away with that tape could soften or that vinyl softened or that FM broadcast softened, now we are likely to hear the full amplitude of those S's. So it becomes an un unforgivable sin at this point. So we've hyped this, the vocal in so many ways to make it sound better, to make it be more expressive. And it's an artifact of all of this that the S's are now too loud. And what are S's? It's basically within this singing apparatus that we call our human voice. It's when we force air basically over our teeth. That leads to an S sort of sound, and it has energy in the sort of 4 to 10K range. It's often focused at 6K, some singers a little lower, some singers a little higher. And basically, how are we going to fix it? We need to attenuate that frequency range, but we only want to do it during the S's because the lift at that frequency range is what makes the vocal so emotional, so beautiful, so full of character. Um, so we don't want to just make the tone disappointing and fix the S's. We'd like to preserve the rest of the tone the rest of the time. And what we'd really like to do is to turn down the, the sibilant range only during the S. We'd kind of like a time-based EQ. And what, ha what has evolved is a frequency-specific compression where basically we have a compressor and the compressor doesn't just ride gain on the vocal, but we EQ the sidechain or the DSer has already an EQ on the sidechain. So it's only focusing on the spectral region of the S's. And the idea is that now the compressor just compresses during the overly loud S's and then it gets out of the way the rest of the time. So DSing is a kind of fix fix, fit, and feature, or how I think about effects, it turns out every recording engineer should know that by the time you've selected a microphone and placed the microphone in a good spot and dialed in other settings to make the vocal larger than life and really beautiful and expressive, you now have a problem probably that the S's are too loud. So we add to that chain the prevention of that problem. We add a de -esser. In terms of should we record effects or not, it's a common question and, 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 and deferring decisions until the mix is a well-known sin. We don't want to do that too often, but mix effects are a near certainty for vocals. It's one of the most critical tracks. So it's unlikely that we wouldn't attack the vocal later with EQ and compression and delay and reverb and so on. So, so why send the, the vocal through an EQ while tracking only to send it through an EQ again while mixing? So a common philosophy is maybe we do minimal processing on this really important track. We just do the sort of protection of the signal, the coaxing of a great signal on the way to the multi-track, but we don't do any heavier effects until mix down because we want to make sure the vocal sits right across the whole full mix arrangement, which we may not know until we're mixing. We may not know at the time of tracking the vocal. So it is common to defer these things. Um, you know, I would say even engineers who are aggressively recording with effects on guitars and drums, that's a very valid philosophy of recording. Those same engineers will still try to barely touch the vocal. And they might, in fact, only have rough effects on the monitor path, not on the channel path. So not getting recorded to the multi-track, but they'll pull up effects like reverb just for the monitor mix. They'll put auto-tune, they'll put aggressive EQ for the headphone send to the singer so that the singer can hear something that sounds like a final product, but what gets tracked to the multi-track is often a short, clean channel path straight to the converters to try to protect the tone of this most probably most important track uh, in our mix. A possible thing then to do while recording, this isn't an industry standard term, but it's what I call it and do it all the time, is a sort of safety compression while tracking. And the goal is just to have transparency and to just very slightly reduce the dynamic range of the signal. So the, the, 
that you really should gain stage it so that the vocal, no matter what the vocalist sings, is never too loud to clip the converters and hopefully never so soft that noise becomes a problem. And for 24-bit and higher recording, our job is much easier than it used to be. But it's still common that the performance dynamics are a little too great. And so we might have a compressor that's set to four to one or even less, and we set it to medium attack, maybe medium to fast attack, and, and, and medium to maybe medium fast release. And the idea is transparency. We don't want to hear it moving, but we want it to ride gain. We want it to narrow the range of the vocal, um, not at the transient level. So this isn't peak limiting, the other effect I was alluding to. This is more riding the performance to make sure if certain words slip, slip out a little bit too loud, we might as well tame them as we record them. And I would say the meter is, is sometimes flat, it's, or, or maybe it's, it's, it's pulling down by one or two dB and probably never more than six or eight dB. And I think I, the reason I had um, this open before is, yeah, I'm, as a courtesy to AES Argentina, I'm speaking to you with safety compression. So I've got four to one, medium attack, medium release, because I know that as a performer, I'm very inconsistent and, and I want you to not be assaulted by certain syllables. So that's actually reasonable meter ballistics that I would expect to see when I'm recording a lead vocal. In terms of fitting things together, we often reach for EQ and compression, and it's largely about intelligibility, making sure that no matter what else happens in the mix, we can understand the words. But we also do some other effects associated with delay and pitch shift and reverb. And I want to introduce to you these concepts of a spreader and a thickener. These are funny words, but the, and I don't think everyone uses these words, but these are very common effects. I didn't make them up. I learned them from greats that I've worked with, and I've spoken with many other experienced recording engineers, and they all do variations on the theme. But let's first look very briefly at EQ strategies. Basically, for every instrument you record, I think you should come up with a cartoon of spectral landmarks that you can remember in your head. So we sometimes see these plots of, of what is the scorable range of an instrument. And I'm sure it's interesting to know if you're writing vocal arrangements, the, the range that a bass, a tenor, an alto, and a soprano can sing. But this tells you nothing about the harmonic structure of the voice, tells you nothing about the relative overtones of a voice. This is just the range of fundam fundamentals that a singer can sing. So I don't keep track of that as an, a recording engineer. I say I need to simplify it. And I say the vowels live low and it starts around 100 hertz for males and around 200 hertz for females, and it reaches up to maybe 1K, 1200 hertz for most vowels. And the consonants overlap with that, but they're living high, they're mids and upper mids. And then up very high is the, 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 the place where air and breath and emotion often is revealed. It can be revealed throughout, um, but this is, this is my cartoon for the range of vocals. I, I think only of, well, these three things, and you'll see one more uh, in addition. Um, well, actually two more, sorry. I think of also proximity effect existing on directional microphones that's in this sort of 200 hertz on down sort of range. It depends on the microphone and the placement. Now the human voice, I, I don't have time to go through this in too much detail, but if you were to listen to the human voice and introduce a high pass filter and, and have that high pass filter just go uh, move the cutoff point for the high pass frequency uh, higher and higher, lower and lower, you'd find that if you don't have the energy from 1K to 4K, you can't understand what they're saying. And you can even do it with a low pass filter. If you have a low pass filter, as you remove the energy from 1K to 4K, you can no, no longer understand what they're saying. Uh, and if you if you have a filter, an adjustable filter with a steep slope, 12 dB per octave or more, you should do this to a lead vocal. You'll find it's it's really critical, basically, that to understand that range from 1K to 4K. And in a lot of ways, 2K, if I had to pick one octave, 2K is the frequency range most essential to understanding the human voice for most languages that I've heard. Um, so, so we have this challenge then for masking, which is the other signals might make it harder to hear 2K within the lead vocal. That is to say, if the electric guitar, the distorted electric guitar has a lot of energy at 2K, 
it may dr drown out some of the 2K of the vocal, and now we can't understand the words. So intelligibility is really a signal to noise ratio problem, specifically in the speech frequencies, which don't go from 20 to 20K. Speech lives between 100 and maybe 4K for the most part. Um, and I'd be even more specific than that. Intelligibility is a signal to noise ratio problem in the 1K to 4K range. Or maybe I take it even further. Intelligibility is a signal to noise ratio problem in the octave band centered on 2K. And signal to noise, what I mean is signal is vocal, noise is the rest of the band, noise is the rest of the mix. Now, if your singer thinks the rest of the band is noise, you can be pretty sure the band is going to break up. But as a mix engineer, if you're fighting for the vocal to be heard, you need to figure out what's going on in the rest of the mix that's drowning out the mid frequency range that makes it hard to understand the words. And electric guitars are a big culprit and too much reverberation can be a big culprit in masking the intelligibility of, of the vocal. So I think of it of, not as a signal to noise ratio, but a vocal to rest of mix ratio focused on the upper mids. Remember that vowels, if, if, if I can simplify the vocal to vowels and consonants, vowels are shaped resonances in the lows to low mids. Consonants are shaped impulsive impulses, broadband instances really in the mids and upper mids. Then I need to make sure those frequency ranges are audible in the crowded mix if I want to hear what the vowels are doing or if I want to hear what the consonants are doing. Another, another way that we uh, fit a, a vocal into a crowded mix is we do these things called doubling, which I know we know all too well, where you finally get the keeper take and then you record multiple versions of it. Uh, and you can do the doubling as many times as you want. You Once you get the right lead vocal, have the singer sing along with themselves and it'll be slightly, slightly different every time, but slightly the same. So let me, uh, let me violate copyright law and play you a song. Um, that illustrates doubling in a really elegant way. It's a song you may have heard of before uh, by a band called The Beatles. Google them. You'll, you, you'll, if you haven't heard them, you might like them. Um, and in this tune, on the word funny papers, a doubling comes in on the lead vocal. And then those doublings are unisons on the lead vocal. And then when it comes to the second verse, they introduce harmony vocals along with the lead vocal, and the harmonies are layered themselves. So I'm hoping you'll hear this audio. I'll, I'll, I'll look to the chat to see if you don't hear audio happening, but assuming it's happening, pay attention to the quality that comes from the addition of these doublings. Sorry, no more listening. Um, but that hopefully it's clear that wasn't done for masking. That was done for beauty. But I, I'm choosing it because it's revealing of the effect. And, and, and if you add that texture and that width and that spectral interest to a track, it becomes much easier to hear. It's an alternative to just pushing up the fader to make something easier to hear. The spreader is a variation on that theme. It's a wacky effect. No one knows why it was invented, but we know why it works. And the spreader effect basically is built of two short delays panned hard, and we pitch shift each of those slightly. So I, I don't feel good unless we do math or do signal flow drawings. So let's draw signal flow in PowerPoint and, and wonder where the day went. Here's, here's the idea. It's an effect built of a pitch shifted delay. So in this case, I'm pitching it up about seven cents. 
It's, it's not a musical interval amount of pitch shift, and it's a tiny delay, maybe as shown here, 11 milliseconds. And then I'm going to have another pitch shifted delay, and I'm going to pitch shift this one in sort of a symmetric way. Pitch this one down seven cents and introduce a different delay. Since I pitched it down, maybe give it a shorter, a shorter delay. And then we'll have some sort of short reverb. This isn't meant, usually isn't a large kind of hall. It's often a short plate or a small chamber. And, and the idea is that we have some aux send, uh, well, sorry, so we have a source track and we raise the aux send that feeds the spreader. And the spreader is basically uh, these two delayed and pitch shifted versions of the same signal. And we send the vocal to the reverb, but we also on those echo returns for the delays, we also send those to the reverb. And in fact, the reverb is probably more favored than the dry signal associated with these delays uh, and pitch shifted elements. So the spreader I think of as the left and right, the, the yellow and green elements, that spreader hits the mix bus dry, but more than that, it feeds the reverb and basically gives you a, a denser, more spread out sort of sound. Uh, and I'll play you an example of that shortly. Um, and of course, the reverb return has to make its way to the mix. So the, it's really those two elements, pitch shifted delay plus reverb. I think I can't remember the last time I did a mix and didn't instantiate this sort of signal flow in the DAW or hook up this sort of signal flow on a mixing console. It's so common, in fact, that there are signal processors, this one's called a doubler, that basically have all the elements. Here's a four, ver a four delay version. I just showed you a two delay version. So now we have four different delay times we can choose. We can adjust the relative level, pan them to any location we want. We can modulate the delay and detune it by any amount we want. This effect is so common that there are many stock plugins that put them all into one device. So I want you to have the chance to listen to this and I'll draw your attention to the tiny URL, um, Vocal Spreader has this audio. So you're hearing audio right now through the Zoom codec. It's These are subtle effects. So if you go to the website, you can later listen to them and hear it with higher fidelity. It, you should be able to get stereo 48K audio from the, the place where I'm serving these videos on the website. But just to orient you to, to what we're gonna see in here, We've got some lead vocal track. So the top faders are, are just Pro Tools with source tracks. I've got some dry lead vocal, and then I've got effect sends. I want us to see the effect sends faders so that you can see what the mixer is doing while the effect happens. So we've got three aux sends associated with the spreader and the next thing we talk about, the thickener. So we won't do that yet. Let's focus on the spreader. And then the output of the, these effects returns on these faders next to the vocal. So that's, these are sort of the screenshots that I'm showing you in the videos that are coming up. The dry track, the reverb returns, which are in fact spreaders and thickeners, which is to say pitch shifted delays uh, with reverb. And then you can see the aux in levels down below. So here's an example then of a vocal spreader. Well, let's make sure we get the signal flow right, sorry. Drive, if, if you're trying to patch this up in your own DAW, DAW choose an aux in for the dry vocal. It goes to the mix bus but it also feeds an aux send, and the aux send feeds two pitch shifted delays, and those pitch shifted delays go through an aux return and make their way to the mix bus. So I'd like to have you hear the, have the chance to hear it with and without the effect. So again, staying oriented, we're only looking at the spreader now. You'll see these meters move when the spreader is fed to the mix bus. The thing to watch is if this mute button is pressed, am I muting the effect or allowing the effect to happen? So the spreader is an, has an interesting application here. We're gonna hear more of the song later, but this singer goes in and out of falsetto. And it's pretty common as an engineer that I wanna support the singer when the singer goes into falsetto. So when they're singing falsetto, a little bit of supportive effects helps make that musically still be strong, even as they've gone into a fragile part of their voice. So you're gonna hear the effect come on when he sings in falsetto. Now you know you know that part of the lyric uh, gets the spreader effect. Or on the phone And now you know You know Or on the phone And now you know you know 
I'm hoping it reads even now, but when you have the chance to listen carefully at that URL, and thanks for adding it to the chat, I think you'll find it's it's disappointing when it's not there. This is not to me meant to be an in-your-face, over-the-top effect. It's meant to be really quite a subliminal effect to help the vocal uh, through a hard time, of th through a weak time, which is to say through a risky falsetto vocal composition. The spreader takes this even further and says, we could do even more. What if we had several delays and we pan them across the stereo field and we pitch shift them and we modulate them? The chorus effect of modulating them gives them further pitch shift. So you can take this idea of a spreader. I, I'm, I'm showing you the simplest version of two pitch shifted delays, but why not have five or six or eight pitch shifted delays of different delay times, different modulation rates, different pitch shifts, pan to different locations. You have to decide when it sounds too unnatural and too artificial, but a subliminal amount of it can really strengthen a vocal. The thickener takes this in a slightly different direction. For the thickener, we're still gonna have pitch shifted delays, but now the delays are echoes. They're long enough in time to be perceived as a separate event. So I'm showing you here, um, we'll have a source track that's gonna get the thickener effect. Echo one is a pitch shifted quarter note delay and sin two feeds echo two, which is a pitch shifted eighth note delay. And sin three sends a reverb and this reverb can be very typically a long reverb, a whole sort of reverb. And for echo return one, think about what we have here. We can send it back to itself for a repeating echo. That's regeneration, but each regeneration gets more pitch shift. We can cross send it to the other side of the thickener, to the other delay time by using echo send two. And of course we send it to the reverb. And a similar thing happens on echo return two. This is the eighth note delay with the pitch shift down. We can cross feed it to the other side, feed it to itself and give it reverb. And then, of course, the reverb itself returns to the mix. There is no right answer for how to adjust this. You now have a synth patch on your vocal in which you get to tune the relative level of echoes. How long do they regenerate? How much do they cross to each other? And most importantly, how much reverb is on them? I would say that in general, my bias for this effect is not to hear the dry echoes. For the most part, this is a reverb heavy effect where the echoes, in fact, are really meant to be kicking the reverb at a musically interesting pulsing rate to make the reverb last longer. And maybe you can get the illusion of a three second reverb, but you didn't have to use a three second reverb with the full wash of decay that it had. Instead, maybe it's a one second reverb that's getting pushed with quarter note repetitions. Again, fairly subtle sort of effect, not always over the top and in your face. So to listen quickly to the thickener, we're gonna have the same sort of situation, a dry vocal, it goes to the mix bus, but now we're gonna reach for a couple of aux sends and send each of them to a pitch shifted echo, a pitch shifted long delay. And then those have an aux return level that in turn feeds the mix bus. So let's have a listen to this. Here's the, and again, we have our last URL and they'll be at the, on the last slide shortly, tiny URL vocal thickener will give you the chance to listen to this critically. Uh, um, uh, watch, watch when the effect is happening. So are these muted or not? Uh, and is the effect making its way to the mix bus with these effects returns? So I just want you to hear if I stop tape, I want you to have the chance to hear what the effect is as it pulses underneath. I'll play it again, but I just want you to hear that's that is the level of it in the mix. He's singing falsetto. This is soloed vocal. The band will be playing shortly, but this is just the pulsing reverberant ear candy that lives underneath his vocal. Things were man. We'll have the chance to look at this more closely in a second. So if we if we put it in a full session. We'll, we'll listen to it on and off. Hopefully that's slightly revealing of the effect. To look at it more carefully then, here's, here's how I would think of the effect 
in, in, we're going to come out of the guitar solo and listen to the last verse, the end of this tune. And the singer's going in and out of falsetto. So I've highlighted when the singer is falsetto. And my mix approach here, there's no right answer, is I'm going to have none of the spreader effect. You'll see the faders are down, no spreader effect when he's singing with full voice, even when the harmony comes in. As soon as he goes to falsetto, I'll turn on the thickener. When he comes out of falsetto, I'll pull down the thickener, leave it in, but I'll pull the level down. He goes back into falsetto, we'll push it up, and then we'll leave it up for the rest of the mix because the whole thing ends in sort of a delicate way. So please watch the, the send faders at the bottom and the relative level of how much of the thickener is feeding the mix bus on these two faders labeled thick inner. Hang in there, we're almost done. And in the interest of time, I'll stop there. There are a few more things I'd hope to go through, but I failed to turn on my share screen begin at the beginning, so we lost some time. Here are the URLs. If you, I know they went in the chat, you can take a screenshot. They're all leading to recordingology.com, where you can listen to these audio examples and much, much more uh, in the comfort of your own control room or your own headphones without Zoom. But I wanted to leave time for questions in case there were any and not run over. Thanks. Okay, Alex, uh, I just wanted to say uh, what many of us, I think, they are saying, wow, <laughs> this was a breathtaking talk. That was great, great, great topic, um, very complex topic and very, very interesting approach. So thank you. Thanks a lot. So uh, um, going to the questions. Um, the, the first question, I will say the question in Spanish and then in English to you. Uh, so, uh, Ezequiel Cociner Blanco pregunta, hablando de gobos, ¿cuál sería el, ¿cuáles serían las especificaciones ideales en términos de absorción, eh, aislamiento y difusión? Um, so, the, the question is from Ezequiel. He's uh, asking, speaking of gobos, which would be the ideal specs in terms of absorption, isolation, and diff diffusion? They're not very picky, is the truth. Um, um, so a great studio will have great gobos for other reasons, but the human voice isn't very taxing on a gobo. So gobos that studios own to help separate guitar amps from drum kits a little bit, they often are... Um, two or three layers of sheetrock or similar mass to be a sound isolator. And then they'll have two to four or six inches of fiberglass to be an absorber. So that's the order of magnitude of treatment. Um, and, and the absorption side is the fiberglass side behind fabric is what I'd put facing the singer. And then the heavy, massive sheetrock side or thick layers of wood, that side is less important to the vocal tracking. I would put that on the outside. I don't want the gobo to be reflective back into the microphone. But if you, even if you have thinner panels of absorption and even, you know, drum blankets draped across mic stands, that also works. So, so gobos that are good enough for other jobs are almost always good enough for this sort of gobo in a vocal. The bigger challenge is, are they tall enough? You want the, the gobos to be stackable or themselves large enough to be above standing 
ear height, standing microphone height for that to work. Great. Thank you. Um, there's another question. Juan Montoya de Colombia. Hola Juan, ¿cómo estás? De paso le mando un saludo. Eh, ¿Podrías hablarnos de la diferencia entre escoger un micrófono para cantantes versus escoger eh, uno para doblaje de animación en animación y películas? So he's asking if you can talk us about the difference between choosing a microphone for singers or versus choosing a microphone for uh, ADR, for post-production, for animation and movies. Uh, yes, for, for ADR, it's curious. For ADR, we often want to match the sound of production sound. So if, 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 unless they know at the beginning that everything will be replaced, they're going to gather sound in production and they're going to do that with lapel mics and plant mics and most especially boom mics and boom mics are often, uh, very directional microphones. So it seems crazy, but in the studio for ADR, we go back and we use a very directional boom mic so that it's the same uh, often Sennheiser microphone that was used when they were doing production sound. Even though for ADR, you could bring in the Telefunken 251 really close and get a better sounding Al Pacino than they got on the set, but we don't do that. We need the ADR to match all the other all the other vocals. So we often just use the same microphone, set it some distance away from the person and have them match the dialogue. Whereas for musical instruments, uh, we we don't we absolutely don't have to do that. Nice. Um, there's another question from Sergio Pauletti. Sergio pregunta, um, dice, el objetivo de grabar eh, voces eh, sin el sonido de la sala eh, es para poder arreglar rever después en, en la mezcla de manera controlada. Entonces pregunta si eh, Alex setea eh, una rever solamente para reflexiones tempranas, como una como una rever de, de ambientes, otra eh, como una rever plate, de tipo plate, eh, para eh, la, la cola de sonido, el tail. O si eh, se maneja solo con un solo sonido de rever de una sola rever, de una sola, de una un, unidad de rever, eso es lo que yo entiendo. So the question is, The goal is to record vocals without the sound of the room. So, for the river in the mix, do you set up uh, a river for early reflections, like an ambient river, and another like a plate for the tail? Or do you try to get all the river sound from one single unit of river? It, it would be the exception. It would be very rare for me to try to get it all from one reverb. Um, I like that you're mentioning early reflections. So some reverb patches let you get at the reflections and kind of grab them and manipulate them in an isolated way. Not cha cha You can change the tail independent of the reflections. So that would be a reason to reach for that sort of reason, uh, that sort of reverb, like a Lexicon 224 large hall plus stage lets you get at the reflections. The stage, the word stage refers to the early reflections because you're going to want early reflections to make the vocal more natural for and, and a little bit wider in the stereo field. And that's a different motivation than, than the reverberant tail. But it's more than that. So I think you might have in the, in the case of the spreader effect that was feeding a large hall. Um, sorry, the thickener effect was feeding a large hall, but at a low level in the mix with pulsing uh, rhythmic delays, I might put that in at an even lower level for a, a busier pop tune. I wouldn't, I would only want that to be audible at very rare moments in the tune. And I'd want a different tail for the other elements of the tune, which might be a shorter tail, like a plate or a chamber. And one of the slides or a couple slides I had to skip is that a motivation for chamber and plate is really not so much about the illusion of space, but it's really a timbral decision. The unique spectral qualities of a chamber And this is why I'm encouraging people to take the chamber reverb challenge. The unique spectral qualities of most chambers and the unique spectral qualities of a plate can be flattering to the timbre of your vocal. So I'll add plate reverb to a vocal to add mid frequency interest that adds character to the singer. And so I might have one reverb doing early reflections, another reverb doing really low level large hall sort of algorithms, and another reverb 
coaxing a new timbre out of it, courtesy of a short, short meaning one second or a little less plate reverb or chamber reverb. And then I might, in addition, say, hey, I do want the singer for this song to be in a space, but a concert hall is the wrong space. A house of worship is too big. So I might also add a medium, medium room sort of patch to then put the singer in a space where it feels like air is moving, that it's not just a close mic track. And again, that's not the right answer. Those are just sort of variables. Sometimes you want it to be very dry. Sometimes you don't want the singer to be in a believable space. And I wanted to uh, add one additional thing, which is the, I, I think when we mix music, we should mix the noise floor, which is to say, when the song has moments of quiet, where it's very revealing of reverb, I don't want it to disappear into the noise of the recording system. Unless the amp buzz is part of the vibe of the tune, I want it to disappear not into noise and hiss, but into reverb that's connected to the vocal or the snare that's just pulsing underneath. So often that thickener effect in a crowded active pop mix, this was more of a ballad that I showed you, I'm actually building a noise floor so that whenever the song is quiet, it's my high fidelity orchestrated quiet which is ear candy related to what the band just did a few instances ago. So those are many different motivations for reverb. My students can tell you, I, my lecture, the unabridged lecture on reverb is three, three hour lectures. Don't get me going. <laughs> That's a great answer. Thank you, Alex. Um, Francisco, do you want to, do you have any other questions? Uh, we have uh, like three more. Okay. Do you want um... to? Uh, first in Spanish, eh, con, con esta nueva eh, realidad o normalidad en, en que hay un incremento en, en la cantidad de, de músicos haciendo streaming, uh, ¿cuáles serían las recomendaciones básicas o esenciales que, que, que vos, Alex, eh, recomendarías para mejorar justamente la calidad de, de la voz? Uh, y otra pregunta rápidamente es, ¿qué micrófono dinámico Uh, ¿Crees que, que puede uh, ayudar uh, con el signal to noise, con el ratio, eh, para un, para un uh, cantante? Hi Alex, how are you? I'm Francisco. Um, the first question is, uh, with this new normality in which increasing number of musicians are streaming live, which essential recommendation would you make for them to improve their voice quality? Uh, oh, this is... That's a, such a good question because this is something we have to figure out. Um, we're, we're asking singers to become recording engineers uh, yeah. for a very important microphone selection and placement exercise, uh, and that's really tricky. So you want a great singer, and, and many established singers have already done this. They, they know which microphones sound good on them in the studio, so, so they'll own one. But it's a ridiculous thing to expect the singer of a touring band who's currently not touring to own a $2,000 or $10,000 microphone. So that's just not fair. But I want to share with you something I learned from a, an AES stream this summer when the pandemic was early on. Um, Shelly Yakis, who's a great recording engineer who worked on Tom Petty, Damn the Torpedoes. He's worked with John Lennon. He's worked with so many people. It's crazy. If you were to look up Shelly Yakis, you'd find out he's worked with Stevie Nicks and I don't know, I can't think of a lot of a lot of bands where the vocal is important. And he said something very wise that that I'm going to try. I haven't tried it yet. And that is that when he's selecting, when he's pairing a microphone with a singer, you think about doing a shootout. Hey, Tom Petty, can you sing into this one? Okay, now sing into this one. Now sing into this one. Hey, let's come listen to it and see which one we like best. You never have time to do that, especially with a superstar. What he says he's done is he sets up multiple microphones near the intended microphone and he just listens to them talk. He doesn't audition them singing. All he does is solo each microphone while talking to the artist and whichever one sounds the most like that artist based on his memory of talking to the artist five minutes ago in the control room, he chooses that microphone. So that I find that sort of relieving that conversation might tell a recording engineer what's important about the timbre and the matching of that. So I think for, for remote recording through streaming, find a way to ship different microphones to singers and just have them talk to them and then choose the right one. But it seems, it seems inconceivable to me that we would expect great 
singers to also have great microphones and preamps and to understand gain staging. So I think we just try to capture the cleanest we sound we can unprocessed without clipping uh, through the best microphone that matches their voice as best as possible. Hopefully we'll figure out a good way for doing this. All right. So there's another question from Javier Flores Carrasco in Spanish. Um, me gustaría saber si todo el proceso eh, de FX también lo haces a las voces dobladas y coros doblados o los tratas diferentes que al lead vocal. So Javier is asking if oh, he says the, the talk was great and uh, he would like to know if all of the FX process, especially the echo, you you also apply to uh, doubling, double voices and background um double voices and or, or if you treat them different than the lead vocal i would say the quick answer to that is that harmonies and doubles and backgrounds get the same approach and often get more of the effect so we can often get away with exaggerated reverbs longer echoes or more regeneration of the echoes for something that's lower in level in the mix we need the singer often to sound natural and believable and real, but also better than real life. But we often think of background vocals and doubles and supporting vocals. They're much more sort of synth effects at the most extreme. So we can we can be more aggressive and more creative with the effects associated with those. Thank you. Um, Cesar Lamstein from Uruguay, um, en español, en, en tu experiencia, ¿Cuánto de cómo suena un idioma o dialecto con, como voz hablada en un país o región tiene su impacto en la voz cantada en un producto musical? La música es un lenguaje universal en relación a la voz. So in English he's asking in your experience how much a language or dialect dialect a spoken word from a country or region has an impact on the sound of sung vocal in a musical product. And then in the, and then in its production process, is music as a, as a universal language in relation to vocal lines sound? Uh, if I understand the question, and it's tricky because Cesar is much smarter than I am, so I may not be understanding what he's asking. But I think haven't we all observed that that when when people are singing, it's the dialect is less clear. I think when we're singing. We're, we're asked to sustain, vo to sustain pitch uh, and to sustain those vowels for a long time and to get through the consonants fairly quickly. And, and the result is an American can't tell if it's an English singer, an American singer, or an Irish singer in their own native language. Uh, and, and, and I think singing basically obscures that. So what's very clear in spoken word, the unique details of, of how we sh shape our resonances when speaking, I think all of those get get made a slightly more uniform when we're asked to sing in our language rather than speak in the language. So I think the uh, for sure music is a universal language and I think when we sing I think we don't consciously do it but I think our the ability for our regional dialects to be understood I think we'd have to force that to happen that but the more we sing I think the more we all sound like we're we're singing the same language. Um So we, we are uh, doing the last question. And this is a question I, I wanted to ask you too. So I, I'm happy that Ezequiel Cociner Blanco uh, asked it. So in Spanish, eh, hablando de reverse, ¿utilizas algún tipo de proceso EQ, filtros, compresión para las reverse de las voces distintas a las de los instrumentos? So he's asking, speaking about reverbs, do you use any kind of process, EQ, filtering, compression, specialty, uh, specialty for the reverb that you send voices rather than the instrument ones? Oh, that's an excellent question. I didn't emphasize this, shame on me, for both the spreader and the thickener effect. Uh, if you And if you look at it online, uh, you'll see The, it's very common to filter the send to that or to filter the returns. So I would say EQ is very, very often on the send to the reverb, 
particularly for chambers and plates. So again, chambers and plates are not hi-fi accurate simulations of space. They're quirky resonant systems that we find useful energy to decorate some aspect of our mix, and in, in this case, the vocal. But it's common that a chamber reverb, uh, you know, a small space has modal resonances well within the audible range. Unlike a concert hall, a huge space, the resonances uh, are either so diffuse uh, that we don't hear individual resonances in a large room very often. But in a, in a chamber, which is to say in a stairwell or a bathroom or a kitchen or a basement, whatever you're using for your reverb chamber, you might find it's muddying. And so you might pull out everything below 400 hertz or everything below 200 hertz on the send to your chamber and let the effect just be about the mids and the highs and, and not let the muddiness happen. So yeah, for because of the philosophy of I use plate reverb for timbre, not for space. I use chamber reverb more for timbre than simulating space. That then tells me absolutely I should feel free to EQ the send or the return. And in fact, for real chambers especially, I'm always EQing the send to the chamber because I know I have a low frequency problem in most chambers and I may have high frequency stuff I don't like in the chamber as well. So EQ for sure is a common effect. Introducing additional effects, flanging the reverb and all of that. Yes, by all means, use your imagination. There are no rules and you're never done mixing. You always want at least one more hour to play with the vocal reverb. It never ends. Sure. So Alex, um, on behalf of, of our prof professional section in Argentina, I want to, to thank you. Uh, I, I know, I'm not sure if uh, my, my colleagues here in, from the section want to thank you or be in the, in, in the camera in this moment, but this is was really a excited time and thank you for being here. It, it's really my pleasure. I hope it wasn't too much in too little time. I, I, I'm sorry if it was cluttered or confusing. I just wanted to share as much as I could. And, and I'm really, really honored to have been involved. I think you guys have created a great event and I'm honored to be a part of it. Thanks. Well, there is um, Cesar. So Cesar, you are in camera. <laughs> You're live. I have three words, only three words. We want more. <laughs> exactly. Para presento a César para todos los espectadores es el vicepresidente de AES Latinoamérica, así que bueno, gracias por estar en el evento. Um, so we want more. That's correct. We are um, thank you Alex again and we are heading to our last talk, last talk of the day.